just like an informal, like, we're gonna go on a journey together talk. So if you wanna move into like these two sections, I promise I don't like bite or throw things. Just right now you're on my peripherals, but you can move up. <laughs> so I'm Kimber. I'm gonna talk to you about vintage internet noise. And I promise that this will not be 25 minutes of listening to dial up tones. Uh, it's taking a look at that old stuff, that old gunk that we see in the packets that come across the internet. Um, I work for a company called Gray Noise Intelligence and what we do is we passively listen to the internet. We have a series of sensors deployed all throughout all kinds of different providers, residential IP space, VPN space, and what we're trying to do is find like unique and interesting stuff and well, sometimes we find out that that stuff that's unique and interesting is actually from 1999, and that's really weird, and it's been a very strange phenomenon that I've really wanted to document. So right now, um, I'm a product manager with them, but I've also worked with their research team really closely, so this is gonna be a presentation about three different CVEs that are by all definitions vintage and I'm so sorry to those of you who may also be considered vintage. Um, this will be a nice trip down memory lane for you. Um, also that girl that just went before me, she was 16. That was an amazing talk. The kids are all right. Oh my gosh. So she, she wasn't even born, um, which is kind of crazy and wild. So. <laughs> Just to level set though, uh, just to kind of bring some perspective to this whole thing, there is internet background noise. So when you plug a device up to the internet, when you plug your router in, the second that that happens, you're getting contacted by outside IP addresses and they're doing things like pinging you, seeing what ports are open, seeing what they can throw at you, and that's what's what re we refer to as opportunistic exploitation. So there's script kitties on the internet, they have things running all the time to try and identify Cisco devices, for example. So that the second there's some kind of Cisco CVE that's out, they can throw it within an hour, within half an hour of that exploit being out. So on a daily basis, you can kind of estimate that you see like 3,000 pings per day, just being a device hanging out on the internet. You can estimate that you see uh, 1,000 distinct IP addresses approximately on any given day. And this, this animation is how we've attempted to represent what this looks like. So just background noise in general, um, mapped to IP spaces. That big dark spot in the top right is DOD space. Nothing goes there, that's illegal. Um, <laughs> so the loudest stuff is obviously like your internet, uh, like DPS providers such as Amazon, DigitalOcean, Google, Microsoft Azure, like all of, the, all of that stuff is pretty loud. So it really depends on where you are on the internet uh, and kind of what your traffic per day is, but we can, we can kind of estimate at this point that most traffic on the internet is just noise. It's just people trying to opportunistically exploit or find things or there's a lot of benign scanners that are out there that just are taking inventory of the internet. So they're taking a look at like what's out there. Um, Census is who I'm gonna use in, as an example in this talk because they do a really good job of service enumeration and certificate enumeration so that when an exploit comes out, we can say, oh, there's uh, actually 5,000 D-Link devices out there instead of the 32,000 that are being reported. So services like this are very important. So what does scanning the internet look like to the end user? It looks like maybe you get 25 alerts in your, in your little SOC platform. Splunk is coming up with, there was an Nmap scan by this one IP address. Uh, you might get look at a PCAP file from 
your router and see this just random blip of traffic and you're like, oh, I don't really know what that is. It just looks like a port scan. It might look like an official HP support issue saying that if your printer is telling you to printing out things, telling you to subscribe to PewDiePie, uh, that was done by internet scanning. That was a real issue, happened back in the day. Pretty cool, pretty cool accomplishment. All the uh, printers attached to the internet printed out something that said subscribe to PewDiePie. And I'm realizing that there might be some people who don't know who PewDiePie is, because that's like an old internet reference at this point, damn. <laughs> Uh, so if we refer to this in professional terms, this is, according to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, reconnaissance or initial access. So we're in the very like far left of that whole big graph that leads to all the other bad things. So I'm going to start with CVE 2002-1042, and this is a directory traversal vulnerability in search engine for iPlanet web server blah de blah 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 but what is important to notice there is Netscape Enterprise Server 3.6. Who has ever heard of Netscape Enterprise Server 3.6? Yes, I see you in the back raising your hand and you over there with the gray beard raising your hand. Thank you for your service, both of you. <laughs> um, it, it's ancient. Unfortunately, we are solidly 20 years past 2002, and unfortunately that is the qualification for being vintage, is being at least 20 years old. So, what does it look like? What is iPlanet's web server? Um, I actually thought it was really, really amusing that the US Department of Veterans Affairs has a huge catalog of just software and whether or not it was okay to use. So this is their VA technical reference model for iPlanet web server. And it was a software that was designed for small and medium businesses to just have a content hosting platform for them to manage their content. So it's kind of like a precursor to WordPress. And what it did is it had they refer to it as pattern files, and they used these pattern files in order to uh, make sure that the right directories on the server were being mapped and surface those up in a way that like made sense to the user. Also, I'm really curious, did any, did either of you that raised your hands work with iPlanet web server ever? Nope, okay, cool. So I'm not butchering that explanation. <laughs> um, but it, it used Java, Java database connectivity, it used some familiar stuff that we see today, but uh, this is what the exploit looks like. So, <laughs> we're gonna walk through it together, because you never know who's looked at packets before, but this is specifically when you look at a internet packet, a network packet, an IPv4 TCP packet, this is the payload field of the HTTP packet. So we're pulling everything apart, we're getting to the good stuff, and we're getting to the payload, because the payload is what's going to show up in your uh, web application firewall logs. It's what's gonna trigger your SOC alert. And so the slash in the beginning indicates the web root directory. So we know that we are throwing an exploit at the web server. We're meaning to manipulate the software that is running the web server. The next part is the function, the search. So this software had a search function in order to surface material that was relevant to the user. Search values after the question mark. And then there's this really interesting part. And this is actually the vulnerable parameter of the CVE. So if we go back to the beginning, which the very last part is dot dot backslash sequences in the NS query pat parameter. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh, that's weird. There's a like typo in this definition. Like, shouldn't pat be path? And what it actually is for is for the pattern files. So this is like a core functionality of the server is having these pattern files that you surface. So next part, dot dot slash stuff directory traversal. Does this pattern look familiar to anybody in the room? 
Okay, good, good. We've got our pattern matching brains on. So this would have would have keyed to you that something was up. Um, and then Etsy password, obviously, spicy valuable info, that's what everybody's going to get for, be looking for. So what this is effectively doing is it's using that vulnerable vulnerable file that is pattern matching to surface that spicy password file via directory traversal. It's really smart, it's really simple. I mean, like, that's why I love the vintage stuff is because it's so understandable and straightforward. But that being said, when this came across my radar, I had never seen that format before. I had never seen what an NS query path. So I thought it was something really good and like really valuable, but then I found out it was from 2002 on a dead software. So surely this cannot still be on the internet. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, we're gonna take a vote. Does anybody think this, is, this iPlanet software is still on the internet? Okay, good, good. You're just as jaded as I am, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm so sorry. It is indeed still on the internet, and we know this by service enumeration. And we used fingerprinting, et cetera, census, the magic of census, uh, to get 306 results on just my initial like dig, which means effectively 306 servers that I could poke at. And I did, um, because research. So my favorite is a community college just using it for their online services. Maybe this is just like a portal that they've end of life and just forgot to take down fully. Uh, who knows? But I dug a little deeper and I found an entire company running this stuff, um, Questa Technologies. And I just have to highlight, since 1996, and if you go to LinkedIn and happen to search these people, Bless their hearts because they have been working there 34 years and four months since 1990. Responsible for all aspects of the business, just... I tried to get in touch um, and Moni, Moni did not want to respond to me, unfortunately. I actually went down a really fun phone trail of like 40 different people trying to find out why is this still on the internet? Because like surely it's been exploited at this point, and I had a very nice conversation with a man named Jimmy, and Jimmy kind of told me, he was like, it was, it was a real honor to like put education software on the internet and like be scanning old books so that people could learn stuff via the internet. And it was a really heartwarming conversation. Jimmy was 88 years old. Uh, <laughs> It was just really heartwarming. There was no moral to that. Just like Jimmy was a really cool guy to talk to and I'm glad that I had that experience. Uh, respect your elders. So surely we don't see activity from those servers because they're still up and running. And I'm gonna leave you on a cliffhanger here because so gray noise records activity that we see scanning the internet and this we leave it open so you can research blah, blah, blah. Um, so I searched one of Questa Technologies IP addresses and what this page is telling us is that it scanned for port 3389 over TCP. And on the back end of this, what I can see is that it only scanned IP addresses in Israel for open RDP ports. And that's a very quiet thing to be doing on the internet, a very directed, targeted, but it is spoofable. So there's this trait of IP address connections that if you only complete part of the handshake, we can't prove that it came from your IP. But I will say, having an iPlanet server that who knows when it was spun up. I mean, it, if you dig deeper into that, it's running on end of life, like version 5.4 free, free BSD is what it's running on. So, Potentially, we don't know who's sitting on Monty's server and I really wanted to talk to him about it, but I didn't. So we move on to the next one. <laughs> uh, CVE 200126, 
Sample internet data query scripts in IIS 3 and 4 allow remote attackers to read files via a dot doc attack. So it's talking about internet, uh, Microsoft Internet Services Server. I forget what the IIS stands for. Anyways, they had these templating scripts, these IDQ scripts um, that were on those very early versions. And this is what the payload looks like. So we kind of see the same pattern going on here. It's a query. It's looking for a particular templating file and using a directory traversal. Neat. I think it's neat. And so I looked at the data and I was like, okay, I can prove that this is ancient. Like, that's fine. It's from the year 2000. I don't know that I even had a conscious thought in 2000, being that I was a child. So who cares anymore? And so in, I think this search was from the last like 180 days. This is how many IP addresses showed up. And this is, all the highlighted ones are the same IP address. So I was like, okay, who's scanning for this? And lo and behold, it is a Nessus server. So that's kind of cool and interesting. We know that by default, Nessus includes a scan for this ancient vulnerability, which is kind of interesting and cool. Nessus is actually like looking out for the homies that are still running the vintage stuff. Respect. Um, no idea who this IP address belongs to. It's just a very sketchy, like random provider in Europe. But this vulnerability is a really interesting one. And I think one of the reasons that we still see scanning for it is much like why we're gonna see scanning for Log4j forever, because it was a like big headline winning like vulnerability that caused a big deal thing called the code red worm. And so <laughs> back in June of 2001, this company stayed up all night investigating some stuff. They were drinking a lot of Mountain Dew code red when they discovered this worm, thus named <laughs> the Code Red Worm. And <laughs> it was uh, this company called EI, and they eventually became a company called Beyond Trust. So really nothing is new. Uh, threat research has been a thing for years and years and years. And basically th we see this pattern constantly in threat intelligence, which is homies stay up all night finding an exploit or finding a thing, they announce it, and then, gosh, eight days later, Microsoft releases a patch. That's pretty fast for 2001. But on July 12th, there's like this worm going through the internet and like it's exploiting all the unpatched computers because people weren't fast enough. Like you didn't have Twitter to tell you what to do in 2001. You just kind of had to be paying attention to Microsoft releasing things. You had to be subscribed to the listserv. You had to be on IRC. So I talked to the guy who um, found the worm. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I talked to the guy who found the worm and I was like, why do you think we still see scanning for this? Like, there's no way the servers are still out there. And he thinks it's just inventory searching. He thinks it's not like anything too interesting. He doesn't think Code Red Worm is still out there. Um, worms do like propagate themselves. This one had a really interesting algorithm where it was semi-random, so it would come up with a script to determine like neighboring IP addresses maybe and then propagate at a random time from there. So there was actually a, if I could just like be a huge massive nerd for a minute, there's some amazing research papers written on this about the diurnal shift of like worm movement through the internet. This is a great thing to like just know your roots on, the code red worm. I don't think we'll ever see any worms ever again, maybe, but um, in any case, Ryan didn't really think it was that interesting, but it was cool of him to respond to my question about why do you still think we see this out there? And finally, our most prolific, loudest, most oldest noise that we see is scanning for CVE 1999-0526, which is 
an X server's access control is disabled and allows anyone to connect to the server. So these are referred to as X11 windows. Uh, it's a little hard to communicate how they look on the other side of the wire, like when you receive this attack, because this is a protocol vulnerability. And an X11 window is what you, I'm gonna explain this really badly just to be succinct. X11 is just RDP for Linux. So it's a rem, like a way of viewing Linux remotely with a graphical interface. And this basically knocks on the door, says authentication, and lets it right through. This is very, very simplified. But it, since it's a protocol vulnerability, you have to actually look a little bit deeper into the packet and look at uh, the hex pattern, which is that 6C000B and then all the zeros. And so this is the Metasploit module and how forming that packet looks. So you can see the Rapid7 rocks in there. That's them like attempting authentication, but Anyways, point being, it's very, very loud. And most of the like, I've actually seen this in socks that I've worked that they'll get alerts for X11 window scanning. And it's just kind of this weird thing because it does still exist in um, modern day Linux. Like you basically have to make sure that like somebody doesn't configure this wrong. You really have to double check because this one is the one that can definitely still be affected because somebody can just be like, I don't understand, why, is it, why am I not able to remotely like view over X11? And though you can set up authentication, it's very hard to disable authentication. People still go and remove authentication from this thing because there's no real way to patch this because it's a vulnerability in the protocol itself. So it's not like there's a program running that spins up X11 and all of these things. Like the protocol is broken. So bless the Linux nerds, they're trying to make everybody adopt what's called Wayland to fix this. It's going about as well as things with Linux nerds go, which is slow and steady. It'll happen eventually. But this is a graph of uh, last seven days, last 14 days, something like that. And we pretty steadily get above a thousand IP addresses on the internet every day, scanning for this thing that was first discovered in 1999. Wild, because it's still, still out there. So why is there so much of this? Because we know it's a really bad problem that cannot be fixed easily because, sorry, Greybeard friend over there. Greybeards love uh, Linux and open source stuff. <laughs> and I think that's why we still see this one. Um, but they know that it's a problem. There's an Nmap scan directly for this. There's a Qualys scan directly for us. Every single vulnerability management software that has a scanning scans for this. So that's why we see it so much on the internet. By default, because X11 is a vulnerable protocol, we see it louder than anything else. So this is just a comparison table of the three different CVEs that we explored, that X server connection attempt being the highest number of IP addresses that we've seen in the last 180 days, that iPlanet file disclosure, the ancient software, we see 33, so a little bit higher, but not too crazy. Um, and then that IIS one, that very specific old version of IIS, the four, the seven version uh, is 17 IP addresses. So uh, it, is that 1999 one the oldest exploited vulnerability? I think it is, and so does this guy named Patrick Garrity. He's a big nerd about vulnerability research. I really respect him a lot, but uh, he kind of posted this thread about like, is there anything older than this CVE 1999 like X11 window shenanigan? And like, is there any volume of people like using X server? So open X11 servers are pretty rare these days, but people always scan for archaic protocols. So. I think that it's worth learning about like our roots and where we came from 
because it kind of informs where we're going. And I guess that's how I'd wrap it up. Like, what do we do? Because there's no real action item here, right? Like, if you don't have an iPlanet server, why are you going to care about that alert? Or why are you going to care about that traffic? And largely, you don't have to. But you can learn a lot from it. Uh, you can learn the pattern recognition, which is absolutely helpful for you in threat research. You can look at what these things have in common to start informing you how to learn about those patterns, which is learn about directly, directory traversals, those like OWASP top 10 type things that are really in these packets. Um, learn about the products that are in, in your infrastructure and how you can use those products against itself. So where, where are the openings there? Where have CDEs been in the past that might inform where they'll be in the future. And as always, the access control struggle bus. Make sure your things are closed. Make sure only the people that have access are the ones you want having access. And just accept that very little is new and novel. We see all this stuff over and over and over again. So learn your patterns, learn your history, and thanks. I don't know. I hope you enjoyed that journey. <laughs>